So Mabrika, everybody, and welcome back to the Taino Heritage Camp. Today, this morning, we are joined by Lynn Guitar for a second reading. We're so lucky. So these readings are going to be going on for 10 weeks. So those of you who are joining us for the first time, I just want um, to give you an opportunity to get to know Lynn as well. So Lynn, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself um, and give us a new anecdote? This week so that readers who have come before get to learn something new. Okay, I fell in love with the Taino Indians and their story way back in 1984. I went to the Dominican Republic with my aunt and until that time I had been studying the Europeans, you know, Christopher Columbus and the other Europeans in the Americas. Right. But in a park called at that time, it was called Parque de los Indios mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic, was mm -hmm. a statue of this beautiful woman, obviously indigenous, and it said, La Poetisa Ana Caona. And uh, I just fell in love with it, with the beautiful statue and the poetry of this, that she was a poet, and the poetry of her name, Ana Caona. And so when I went home, I started studying the Taino Indians and I have been uh, uh, in love with them ever since. In love with them ever since. And growing <laughs> as well and spreading. Yes. Which is beautiful. Oh, yes. You know, um, I was actually going to ask you that exact question this morning. Yeah. I was going to say, let me ask her why it was that she was so inspired by the Tainos to start her research on them. But it was just so silly that I had already done research on on Christopher Columbus. It was the it was all in 1984 we were coming up to the quincentennial, and mm -hmm. I wanted to write the um, the historical fiction novel of mm -hmm. of, Chris, of Bartolome Colon and how he came to write his father's biography. And once I had visited the Dominican Republic, I switched I switched rails completely. Yeah. And, uh, I've been, been a Taino fanatic ever since. Um, it is, it, it's very important for that, that um, other perspective to be told. And I think that's what I love about the movement that is happening with the Tainos and the communities behind it. Because it's, it's kind of unearthing another truth, you know? So you have... European standard and because we were under under European rule for such a long time it has become a standard in our education system as well and so there are persons like yourself the Taino Heritage Camp unearthing like uh, the other perspective it's not necessarily that the other stuff was lie but yeah, I don't yeah. want to, yeah. <laughs> to protect it's the other perspective, it's the truth from the other side, you know, so it can kind of break a lot of the, um, the misunderstanding about the Tainos. I agree. You, yeah. seeing, it, seeing it from both sides, you get a much clearer picture. Right, and exactly. It's only the Spanish side that has been heard. My work, right. um, my research was the very first, my doctoral dissertation actually was the very first professional uh, work, professional written work that proved beyond a doubt with tons and tons of documents that I unearthed in Spain that uh, the myth of the Taino uh, disappearance was a myth, that it was totally a cover up and a lie and that the Taino people have always existed and still yes. do yes. today. Yes. Yes. Not yes. as indigenous, no longer as as the presiding yeah. culture, but right. sounding they blended, in, they sure. blended into a common culture. Right. But it's but it's also the founding culture of many of the Caribbean yes. islands. It's the um, base. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything else was just built on top of it. The Taino people adopted some of the um, the, the Spanish ways. 
Right. And Spaniards adopted many indigenous ways. <laughs> and, and a lot of the words borrowed a lot of the, um, the lexicon from the Spanish, sorry, from the Arawakan language. Yep. There's a lot of words that, um, you know, that the Spanish still use today. Oh, yeah. Based on Taino words. And yes. in English as well, like hurricane, canoe, many words um, yes. have borrowed. Hundreds, hundreds of words are all Taino based. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> it does make you incredibly proud. It really does. It yes. makes you incredibly proud. Um, so what's the name of your second book? Okay, this second book is called No More Grading Yucca. The first book was The Legend of, of Niraru Cave, right. and it featured Kaya Bo. Uh, the two main characters in the entire series are Kaya Bo and his sister, Anani. Uh, my daughter uh, teaches literature in Alaska, of all places, oh, wow. <laughs> and she's taught for many, many years, uh, I guess almost 30 now, and she's discovered that boys like to read about boys. Girls will read about both boys and girls. So what right. I decided to do is each of the 10 books will have both Kaya Bo and Anani. And then the we flip. book features, features Kaya Bo, and this book, the second book, features Anani. I love it. <laughs> okay, so shall we start? Sure. I'm really, I'm looking forward to this one because I'm a girl. <laughs> yes, and I, I think you'll like it. Her, her, her personality, I think, is the personality I would have liked to have had myself. <laughs> okay, here we go. No more grading yucca. Anani sighed aloud at the giant mound of peeled yucca that remained on the large wooden platters, yucca tubers that she and the other women and girls in the covered work area still needed to grate before the main meal of the day. She looked down at her hands with their multiple raw red scrapes from just two hours of using the coral stone grater. Hatabeira, <sighs> she said in a voice not even loud enough to be called a whisper while briefly lifting her eyes skyward. You who are the protector of all women, do you dislike preparing the yucca for cassave bread as much as I do? What did you say, Anani? asked Naneke, one of her mothers, who was working beside her along with a dozen other women of Kaleta. Their fishing village was known as Kaleta and it was located facing a beautiful inlet, one of only a few along the rocky coast on the southern part of the island. Let me pause for a moment and show you the cover of the book with a drawing by Tally Saxton, an illustration of Tally Saxton in color of Anani and the other women, including her mother, Naneki. Okay, great. I always look forward to picture time. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here they are, grading yucca. Okay, great. And those are the stone, the stone graters. graters. Right, so they're usually made of coral. Right. Okay. Do you see Anani? She's the one pointing. Oh, okay. And in the middle is the is the is the cassava or yucca. Right. Okay, great. Wonderful. Beautiful drawings as always. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they've just asked her what Naneki has just asked her what she what she said, and she says, "Um, um, Anani stalled, not wanting to admit how much she hated this work that nearly all women shared." I said. I said, I hope the men return before the baguala sweeps in from the sea. Naneki looked up from her grater toward the sky. Says, I see no sign of a rainstorm. That's what a baguala is. Anani bent down and redoubled her grating efforts. She felt guilty for including Atabeira, the greatest of the female guiding spirits, in her dislike of braiding yucca. But she felt she could confide in her. She had always felt warmth and love whenever she asked for help from Atabeira, almost as if Atabeira were another of her mothers. The woman beside Naneke began singing a song about the tiny colibri, the hummingbird. Anani was grateful for the diversion. These ancient songs always lightened everyone's spirit. They seemed to make the work fly by rapidly, like the lovely little bird. Several hours later, just after Gwe, the sun, had passed its highest point in his journey across the sky, Anani and the others spread the freshly grated yucca in large baskets and placed them on the conical roofs of their boios, their homes, to dry in the sun. They then joined the rest of the people of the Yucca Jeke, their residential area, 
um, they joined them around the cooking pots. Everyone ate their fill of cassave dipped into gourds full of the spicy Akiako's broth. Akiako is a kind of stew that they ate every day. Today's ahiako was a special treat because the principal meat in it was the rich flesh of the large tiburon, a shark that had been caught yesterday. One of the fishermen who had helped capture it was Anani's brother, Kayabo. She smiled with pride, thinking about Kayabo. The two of them had begun to develop an especially strong relationship three months ago after saving the village from a drought by rediscovering ancient subterranean pools of fresh water a liquid treasure buried deep within what everyone now called the Nirau Cave, Children of the Water Cave. As she washed and rinsed her now empty gourd bowl and spoon with clean sand and a bit of fresh water, Anani looked out to sea. I know, she yelled aloud. She saw thick dark clouds on the horizon. The breeze was freshening during the, was freshening, driving the inky clouds and several canoas towards shore. Flocks of chattering seagulls were flying overhead, seeking shelter in the forest beyond the Yukayeke's Kanuko, the big community garden. That was an ominous sign because the birds usually rested while floating out at sea. Could this really be a baguana? She had fibbed about seeing signs of a storm coming this morning, and it was not the season for them. Hecate, Jamoka, Kanukum, that's one, two, three, Anani counted aloud as three canoas full of fishermen approached the shore, paddling as fast as they could. A dozen men and boys ran down to help them land and secure their boats. She scanned the horizon anxiously for signs of more returning canoas. It was not long before two more arrived, but neither held her family members. <sighs> she stood there until the men from those two were helped ashore, too, looking for signs of any more of the canoas from Caleta. There was one more but it was not the canoe with her fathers and brothers aboard either. Aye, she yelled aloud as it turned over several lengths from shore, the waves from the growing baguada tossing out the men as if they were peelings from yucca thrown into the trash pile. It took several minutes to get all six of the men and their canoe safely ashore. By then, both the sky and the sea were more angry looking than ever. Perhaps, perhaps a song would not last very long, Anani hoped, glancing briefly toward the heavens. Reluctantly taking her eyes off the water, she ran for her moio to help take the baskets of grated juca off the roof and store them inside until the threat of rain had passed. Anani spent the next hour inside helping her four bibi, her mothers, to keep their smaller brothers and sisters happily occupied while the winds raged and the rains fell heavily outside. Sing for us, Anani, begged five-year-old One, speaking loudly over the sound of the rain and the wind. You have such a pleasing voice, Anani. They were seated on woven mats on the floor where the girls were making dolls out of braided grasses to pass the time, and the younger boys were busy carving wooden lances under the careful eyes of their older brothers. All the children gathered more closely around Anani as she hummed a questioning melody then decided on the praise song to Guavan Sex, the powerful female who was the living spirit of the hurricane, the hurricane. She began to sing in a strong, clear voice. Guavan Sex, do not be angry with us, your people. Do not tear down our boios. Do not destroy our canucos. Do not drown our menfolk out at sea. The children began humming the counterpoint, some also clapping their hands to the beat. As the rhythm grew stronger and faster, some of the older children stood to dance, swirling their arms in graceful circles, okay, like the swirling winds of the huracan. Anani continued singing. We will sing and dance in your honor, dearest Guavan Sex, dearest mother. If you do not send your assistant, Coatrixie, to gather up the waters in his deep beak. If you do not send your assistant, Welcaba, to gather together all the winds of the earth to show the extent of your power. Anani was joined now in the final chorus by her mother's accompanying voices. But if you must come, dearest Guaban Sex, we will welcome you, knowing that your destruction is only temporary, knowing that your destructive power 
is the beginning of new life. New life that will grow from the old. New life that will grow from the old. Two of the young dancers continued swirling their arms after the song ended, laughing and mocked, threatening their younger brothers and sisters, saying, Dakai, Guaban Sex, I am Guaban Sex, in wavery, frightening voices, until Kamagwea, one of their mothers, made them stop. Before the children could settle back down and return to making braided dolls and carving lances, the rain stopped. The clouds scudded away toward the mountains of the island's interior, and Gwei came out in all his golden glory. The children ran out the door to splash in the puddles left behind by the Baguada laughing and shouting. Anani stayed behind with two of her older sisters to clean up the doll making materials, which only took a couple of minutes. As she was about to leave the bolillo, she noticed that the three youngest of her mothers, Banika, Kamagueya, and little Warishi, had formed a semicircle around Maneke, who was whispering something to them. It sounded like, how did she know that too? They all turned to look at Anani as she exited the bolio to relieve herself and to take an evening bath. What was that all about? Anani wondered to herself. Early the next morning, all the rest of Kaleta's fishermen returned, except for Anani's family. The fishermen told tales of swirling winds, waves higher than most trees, close calls, and the night passed shivering in the wet darkness far from home. No one seemed overly worried about the missing Tanoa except Anani, for the others were certain her brothers and fathers would be back before the main meal. <sighs> Anani felt a throbbing ache in her head, and, and something more. She felt a cold lump of fear stab her in the pit of the stomach as she received a fleeting vision of Kaya Bo, one of her brothers, in pain. She vaguely remembered waking up in the darkest hours of the night trying to shake off a nightmare about him. She had felt confused and hot in her nightmare, even though yesterday's unexpected baguaba had brought strong, cool breezes with it that lasted throughout the night. She looked up briefly toward the sky, asking Atabeira to ensure that Kayabo had not come to harm. Anani tried to shake off the ominous feeling that trying to remember the dream gave her by filling a wooden plate with pieces of fresh papaya that some of her older sisters had prepared and dipping a gourd into the cooking pot to fill it with yesterday's warmed up ahiyako. She ate seated on a woven mat just outside her family's boio. Delicious though it was, she could not finish the morning meal. Her gaze shifted from her bowl to the sea, noting that the waves had begun to subside and presented a surface that reflected the golden colors of the rising sun. That filled her with hope. Then she looked toward the workspace where the women were meeting, starting to gather to great yucca. <laughs> she exclaimed aloud, dreading yet another day of that horrible work. Vanika, the mother who hardly ever paid any attention to Anani, only to making her beautiful pots, came out of the boio and sat beside her. Vanika leaned over to touch her forehead to Anani's informal greeting. Rahe, daughter, she said, it's time to see if you have any artistic talent. Today, instead of grading Juka, I have asked that you be allowed to come with me to the ceramics workshop. Is that agreeable to you? Anan, <laughs> yes, shouted Anani, jumping up with joy. She glanced upward, giving silent thanks to Atabeira for answering at least that unspoken prayer. The ceramics work area was behind the boios, just to the west of Caletas Conucos the gardens. It was roofed but open to the air on all sides, like the women's yucca working area, but it was larger. Inside were a dozen flat slabs of stone propped up with smaller stones where individual potters could work on their vessels. On one side of the roofed area were deep clay pits, and along another side were two large wooden planks for sun drying the completed pots, plus more pits, shallow ones, for firing the vessels after they were sun dried. Monica led Anani to one of the stone work slabs. Sit here beside me and learn, Anani, she said, indicating a worn straw mat. I will be right back. She returned a few minutes later with two large rounds of clay. This clay has already been prepared by some of the new girls who want to be ceramicists. They have removed all the sticks and small stones and made certain that it is a good workable clay. But you must still handle it with love before you can start to make it 
obey you, she said, so copy what I do. Anani watched as Bonica use both hands and her strong muscular arms to fold the clay from end to end, pushing it down and smoothing it, then folding it again, pushing it down and smoothing it over and over again. Anani attempted to imitate Bonica, but the clay was cold to the touch, stiff and difficult to manage. Her arms began to hurt after just a few minutes. Plus the clay was sticky and it kept leaving hunks stuck to her hands that she had to wipe off and then return to the main mass. Monica laughed, but it was a warm laugh that comforted Anani. You'll soon get the feel of the clay, she said. Keep kneading it until it is warm to the touch and no longer sticky. She sat back and watched. A short while later, she said, it looks ready. Can you feel the change in temperature and consistency? I, I think so, said Anani hesitantly. Now break off a small ball of it like this. And Bonica held up a piece about the size of a grown woman's fist. Roll it carefully into a small coil like this. She rolled the clay first in two hands until it was like a fat tube of Cohiba tobacco. Then she laid it on the stone slab and began to roll it some more using both hands to make the coil longer and smaller around like a snake. Anani copied her thinking that this part was fun. When she transferred the fat roll of clay to the stone slab, however, and began to roll it, some of the snake stayed fat while other parts were very thin, unlike Bonica's long coil of clay that was the same thickness from one end to the other. Oh, Anani. <laughs> you must roll the coil carefully and gently, Anani, said Bonica. Start in the center and move your hands bit by bit out to each side. If you see that one part is far thinner than the rest, you can break it off there and use it as two separate coils. Anani tried to even out her coil, pinching it off at the thinnest part to make two somewhat similar coils. Good, said Monica. Now, make ten more, but longer. <sighs> when they both had twelve snake-like coils of clay ready, Bonica got up again and came back with two medium-sized sea sponges and two large clam shells full of very watery clay. This watery clay is the glue that will hold the separate coils together, she explained, pointing at the watery clay. We start the pot by forming its open top and we work upward toward the bottom, like this. And she laid a coil in a circle about two hand widths wide on the stone slab, pinching off the extra clay and dropping it beside the, lar the longer coils. Anani did the same. Now, using the wet sea sponge, we add some of this glue to the two ends and we smooth out the coil to seal it together as one circle, she explained while doing so. And we put a smooth coating of glue on the top of the coil like this. Good, continued Monica, glancing over at Anani's work. Now add the second coil, making it a little bit longer than the first and moving it just a little bit outward so that the finished pot will curve downward and get bigger toward the middle. Be sure to join the two ends of each new coil in a different location than on the others to keep the pot's walls strong. Very good. Now smooth the first two coils together using a little of this glue on your fingers like this. They each added a third coil to the two, uh, of two, first two of their individual pots, then sponged more glue on top of it so they could be joined by a fourth, each coil a little longer than the previous one. The fifth coil will be a little longer yet, and the sixth, said Bonica. Then two of about the same size, and the final four will get smaller each time and move inward so that they make the pot curve toward the base. Here's Anani and Naneke, one of her mothers, um, making clay pots. Oh, that's they beautiful. Yeah, they didn't have a potter's wheel. The time right, so they had to build it, like right. almost like bricks. Yes. They and built uh -huh, right. with clay coils like right. snakes. Yep. And then they kept smoothing them. Uh, the Tainos were expert potters. Some of this oh. stuff has lasted 2,000 years and we still have bits that are still together, you know? So. Yes, it's beautiful, beautiful. Anani almost managed to keep up with Bonica. Bonica said, now we moisten our hands with the liquid clay and we smooth the pot surfaces, both on the inside and outside. Good, the walls of your pot are smooth and thick, but not too thick. 
Now add some glue to the top of the last coil and we'll make the base, said Monica, showing Anani how to form a flat round base about the thickness of her little finger out of a small ball of flattened clay. She then trimmed it with a clamshell knife to the exact size of the round hole at the top of the multiple coils, put it in place and carefully smoothed the base onto the last coil to ensure that it was well secured. Anani copied her move for move. There, said Vanika, the basic shape is complete, but the pots are upside down. We have to very carefully turn them right side up. She did so using her, her uh, clamshell knife to separate the first coil of her pot from the stone smooth surface. Then she set the pot down right side up and handed Anani the clamshell knife. Anani was successful up to the point of actually setting the pat, pot down right side up. That's when disaster struck. For as she turned the pot in the air, it collapsed in her hands. Aye, she yelled. <laughs> Again, Bonica laughed a warm laugh. Don't worry, it happens to nearly all of us on the first dry ray. You must be gentler with the freshly molded clay. You must treat it like a newborn babe. She took the misshapen pot carefully out of Anani's hands, reaching one hand inside and swiftly molded it back into shape before setting it upright on the stone slab in front of Anani. Now we form the upper rims. Anani followed Bonica's movements, enjoying the slippery feel of the clay against her hands as she smoothed the coils to form the elegant round rim of her pot. Bonica showed her how to use the clamshell knife to set to cut a straight edge at the top. Then Bonica handed Anani another small ball of clay and said, before you shape the pot's handles, I want you to close your eyes and think very hard about the completed pot. Ask it what it wants to represent. Imagine its completed form in your mind before you finish bringing it to life. Anani thought back on the many pots she had seen, some with handles representing the spirit of the frog, others the spirit of bats. And she had a brief but vividly clear image of her brother Kayabo with the green stone sculpture of a carré, a sea turtle on a cord around his neck, a figure that he had worked on constantly for the past three months and now wore very proudly. At that instant, she knew what her pot wanted to be. Vivi, she said, looking over at Bonica, may I reshape the opening and make it oval instead of round? Of course, uh, hey, said Bonica, it is your pot. She watched as Anani remolded the neck of the pot into a graceful oval and added, well, not handles exactly, but a small head at one end, a tail at the other, flanges on both sides to represent the edges of a turtle's shell and four small flippered feet. Anani's fingers formed the various parts of the figure rapidly as if they were being guided by a master sculptor and she used the knife to add details to the flanges, tail, head, and feet. What emerged was the very recognizable image of a kare. Why, exclaimed Vanika, who would have guessed you could sculpt such a delightful creature and on your first attempt? Tell me, if you can, what inspired you to create this image? It is an honor of both my brother Kayabo and his spirit guide, Arokael, our beloved grandfather, said Anani. She added, and it is also a plea to the guiding spirits for Kayabo's safe return. I see, said Bonica, smiling. Let's add the finishing touches. Patiently, she showed Anani how to make delicately incised geometric decorations in a band around the pot's center using the knife, then how to smooth them gently with moistened fingers. Now we will put our pots on the drying rack in the sun until they are dry enough to fire them, said Bonica. Come. We can bathe in the river and join the others for the meal. Perhaps Kayabo and your fathers have already returned, but they had not. Late that night, Anani had another nightmare, this time far more vivid. She saw Kayabo as if she were a spirit hovering just above him. He was lying on palm leaves that had been laid on the sand. He was unconscious, groaning with pain and racked with fever. Anani cried out feeling his pain as if it were her own pain, feeling his fever as her own. Looking down at the body, his, but somehow hers as well, she saw that the muscular left leg was swollen and red, jaggedly raw and oozing pus streaked with blood. One of her older brothers, Mahagwa, 
was dipping a sea sponge into a gourd of fresh water and squeezing, squeezing drops of it into Kayabo's mouth while her fathers were repairing the canoa, which had a jagged hole in one side. You must clean the wound with seawater and pack it with seaweed, a soft female voice whispered in Anani's ear. It was the warm and loving voice that responded whenever she prayed to Akabeira. Still deep in her dream, an image drifted into her mind of the dark black green colored seaweed that grew among the corals, the kind with small balls embedded in its stems. And do not forget my child, the loving voice continued, to ask the plant's forgiveness and for help in curing your brother's wound. Still hovering over the dream scene, Anani looked around and did not recognize where she was, although silhouetted against Karaya's, the moon's light, she could clearly see the shape of a shoreline. They were on a small, rocky, humpback islet with other humpback islets visible all around them. Above, a huge gnarled tree guarded the islet's highest point, and directly across from them was the gaping mouth of a seaside cave with stalactites and stalagmites that looked like the teeth of a hungry tiburon shark. Naneke, who had jerked awake when Anani cried out in pain, went swiftly to her side. Anani, are you all right? She asked softly, reaching out to hug her. Anani struggled to leave the dream and come back into her own body, her hamaka, her boio. She hugged Naneke tightly, shivering despite the warm night. I was dreaming of Kayabo, she whispered. He is hurt. His left leg is badly cut and he's feverish. I need to go to him. Atabeira told me how to cure him. Naneke woke up her other mothers, and Anani repeated her dream. They decided that she must speak with Tasite Guavos at dawn. For the first time since she was a young child, Anani slept what was left of the night in Naneke's hamaka, wrapped tightly in her mother's arms. In the morning, Tasite Guavos listened attentively as Anani recited what she had seen and heard in her dream. She is very young, he commented aloud after she had spoken but one must not question the wisdom, wisdom of the ancestors. Looking around at his advisors who were gathered closely around him, he asked, does anyone recognize from Anani's description where her fathers and two brothers are stranded? I do, said Akobo, an old man at the rear of the circle of elders who had been a sea trader for most of his life. The storm must have blown them a long way, for that is the very description of a site in a large bay far to the northeast in the land of the Siguayo tribe. It will take us a full day or more to get there, even with the best rowers. The Cacique sent Akobo, Naneke, Anani, and Kaleta's two healers, Umatex and Kagwa, accompanied by six strong rowers in one of his own large but sleek and swift canoas to the rescue. They left before the main meal. Anani woke up when the light misty rain began to fall. She snuggled closer to Naneke in the bottom of the canoa, but could not fall back asleep. It was very dark, but the rowers were still paddling hard. Careful not to awaken Naneke, Anani sat up and looked around. Taikaraya, good evening, one of the rowers greeted her. She returned the greeting with a smile and a nod of her head. He passed her a small gourd full of water from which she drank gratefully before handing it back. After using the women's larger gourd to relieve herself, she carefully emptied it overboard, rinsed it, and settled back in the canoa. Off to the left, she could just make out the outline of the shore. Above, Karaya peeked in and out of fast-moving clouds, and off to her right, there was just a hint of dawn. She breathed in the fresh sea air, thanking Atabeira for having given her a night without bad dreams. It was not long before the others also awake, awoke. Naneke passed out pieces of smoked fish wrapped in palm leaves, cassave, and some fresh ana anana, pineapple. Akobo assured them they were not too far away no now. Just a little further north, the shoreline turned sharply west, he said. We should reach the cave of the Tiburon soon after Gwe is at its highest. Anani was the first to spot the cave among the humpbacked islets that were just like her dream. There, she said, pointing ahead to the cave that looked like the open mouth of a hungry tiburon as a kobo guided the rowers around a small island circled by thousands of birds. And here it is, 
and this this oh let me see where i can get it better <laughs> i can't see where i'm holding it there we go there's there's the that's perfect full of people and there you can you see that island with the mouth that looks like a hungry the mouth that looks just like the shark with tiburon yeah yes and that that little island and that cave really exists oh really oh yes i should have asked you because i knew it would <laughs> They really exist. They're in an area that today is called Samana. There he is, Anani repeated. And on the southern shore of the rocky islet facing the distinctive cave, they could see the gnarled tree at the top of a tall cliff that Anani had described and the beached canoa on a tiny bit of sandy shore below it. Her brother Mahagwa was the first to spot them. He let out a grateful shout of welcome, as did Anani's three fathers, as soon as they too spotted the rescuers. Taino tea, Taino tea, they shouted as they helped land the large canoa, anchor it safely to a small but secure tree, and assist the newcomers ashore. Naneke and Anani received forehead to forehead greetings as warm hugs from and as well as warm hugs from Mahagwa and Anani's fathers, Ayati, Bamo, and Marakai. Anani then ran to her brother Tayabu, who was lying in the shadow of the cliff. He was not conscious. His fever was very high, and more bloody pus oozed from his wounded leg than there had been in her dream vision. Her brother, fathers, and the two healers gathered around the pair. The waves slammed him upon the same coral that damaged the canoa, exclaimed Bamo, one of her fathers. We've done all we can for him, but his fever is rising. He has had convulsions and has been unconscious for more than a day and a night. I fear he is not long for this world. Can you help? He asked Umatex and Kagwa. The yes, two healers the two healers just looked at each other helplessly, then back at him. Together they pointed at Anani. Anani remembered the voice of Atabeiro whispering in her ear. She stood up straight and said, Father, in order to heal Tayabo, I need some of that dark colored seaweed that has the small balls embedded in its stems and leaves. By the way, that seaweed, which is very, very common all over the Caribbean, contains iodine. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Naneki explained um, the strand. <gasps> But the stranded men all looked with surprise at her that she had had a vision sent by Atabeira about how to heal Kayabo. She's so young. Without a word, Mahawa walked into the water, then dove under. He came up for air once, twice, and then swam ashore with a large armful of the common seaweed and brought it to his little sister. Umatex and Kagwa took some coiba tobacco out of their makutos, the woven baskets they carried and set it to burn in the bowl of an elaborate clay vessel and also took out their healer's maracas. As the sacred smoke spiraled up into the air, Anani carefully began to clean her brother's cut leg with salt water and a sea sponge, packed it with the seaweed and wrapped it with a clean piece of cotton cloth. The two healers chanted, keeping rhythm with their maracas, one each, by hitting them on the open palm of their free hand while slowly circling in a two-step dance around Kayabo and Anani. Anani nearly vomited several times as she carefully cleaned the gaping, bad-smelling wound, washing away all the pus that she could squeeze out of it. She was glad that Kayabo was unconscious, for cleaning and then packing the leg with seaweed would no doubt have been very painful if he were conscious. All the while she worked, Anani prayed to both Atabeira and the seaweed, which she also thanked for its sacrifice, to make her brother well and healthy again. In return, even though she was awake, she kept receiving visions of how to proceed. When she finished, she sat by Kaya Bo, her back against the rock, and lifted his head onto her lap. After a moment to listen to Akabeda's continuing advice, she asked Naneki to bring her two gourds, one with clean salt water and one with fresh water. Anani spent the rest of the afternoon cooling Kayabo's forehead with a cloth dipped in the cold salt water and alternately moistening his mouth with a few drops of fresh water. At dusk, Umatex and Kawa put away their sacred cohiba and maracas, and Anani got up to stretch and swim briefly in the warm, salty waters of the bay. Mayra Kay, one of her fathers, brought her some cassabe to eat, 
along with a gourd full of a delicious soup of freshly caught fish and some edible greens that Naneke had gathered. After eating, Anani again took up her vigil with Kaya Bo. Toward dawn, he groaned several times but remained unconscious. The exhausted rowers, since they had lain down to sleep before sunset, were the first to awaken just before dawn. In the golden light of the new day, she unwrapped Kayabo's leg and saw that it looked much better. It was still inflamed, but no pus, and his fever was noticeably lower. She washed his wound again with salt water, repacked it with the fresh seaweed, and wrapped the leg again after rinsing the cloth bandage in the bay's clean water. Again, she settled her, his head on her lap and began to alternate the cold cloths on his forehead with drops of fresh drinking water on his lips and into his mouth. Everyone was now awake and commented, commented on how much better Kayabo looked. After a light breakfast of lef leftover fish broth and cassave, Umatex and Kagwa began their sacred rituals again, and Anani went back to tend Kayabo. Everyone else worked together to finish temporary repairs on the damaged Kanoa. When it's a full sister. Uh-huh. When Gwe was still high in the sky, but not yet ready to slip back into the sea, Kayabo awoke. So you did come, Anani. Arokael told me that you would. He struggled to sit up and did so with her help. After taking a long drink from the gourd of fresh water, he continued, Arokael also told me that you have been specially chosen by Atabeira to be trained as a beika, a medicine woman, a shaman. Is it true? I, beloved brother, even though you were unconscious, you appear to know more than I do. <laughs> so, Mabrika, everybody, and welcome back to the time. Uh, here they are together, by the way, when he's woken. He's woken up. See, they're sitting against the cliff. Yes. So, Lynn. <clears throat> okay. Oh. The mountain and the island back. There are still eight more stories. And there they are. Stories. Stories. Yeah, 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 no, you can see his leg wrapped Looking forward as to well. them for yeah. one. Definitely. And I know that everybody so is really sweet. enjoying them. Like, so if you want to actually book? purchase the books, you can go to no, our website alone. and the link is down she below. Is so don't forget to subscribe okay, right, yeah. and like our channel like and then you can get notifications okay. as to when Lynn is going to be on with new videos. So thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next week. Burst. Take Both care. Hours so, Lynn. For the stony beach <clears throat> Great stuff. Really. Everyone from the Juca Jeque, even the hunting dogs, gathered to welcome them and help them ashore. Mahagwa carried Kayabo on his shoulders. His leg was better, but he still could not walk. Maumatex and Kagwa lifted Anani and carried her triumphantly through the waves to the beach. There would have been more of a celebration for their safe return but both the rescued fishermen and the rescuers were very tired. So Cacique Guabos decreed that a celebratory areito would be held later. Bending down to rest his forehead first against Naneke's and then against Anani's in warm greeting to both of them and their semis, he whispered, and at the same time, we will announce that Anani will be our next beika. As a nani holding tightly to Naneke's hand, headed toward her bolio with all of her reunited family members, she asked aloud, Does this mean I no longer have to great Yuka? <laughs> the end. <laughs> <laughs> and we will definitely see more. Still, she's still a little bit 10 years old. <laughs> yes. But that's a wonderful story. The details in it again kind of allow people to get that view into pre-Columbian Aino culture, and I know that I know that <clears throat> um, it was a very similar culture, like in terms of how we built our pots in all of the islands, not just in Kiskeya or Dominican Republic. Right. Today they use uh, potter's <laughs> wheels, but right. Um, but the coil method is still a beautiful method that's that a lot of potters like to learn because it's the it's the because it's ancestral right yeah. right and of, and of course they want to come and say hi quickly it's the story over. yes the story is oh. over. say hi to auntie lynn hi, auntie hi. Lynn. <laughs> say thank you for the story thank you for the story and we'll see you next week
Come yes. on. We'll see you next week. Okay, I'm looking forward to it, sweetheart. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for listening. And uh, I'll be back. There are still eight more stories. Um, yeah, I know. I am looking forward to them for one. Definitely. And I know that everybody is really enjoying them. So if you want to actually purchase the books, you can go to our website and the link is down below. So don't forget to subscribe and like our channel and then you can get notifications as to when Lynn is going to be on with new videos. So thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.